All right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is James Chang, and I am with the University of Oregon Alumni Association as director of the Duck Career Network. And I welcome you to this webinar uh, being broadcast from downtown Eugene, uh, a new building that we currently uh, refer to as 942 Olive Street. Uh, you'll be hearing much more about it throughout this program from um, uh, especially one of our featured alumni speakers. Um, the, the agenda for today is really to focus on three stellar alums who are doing amazing things in the areas of tech. Uh, this is a focused uh, conversation around ducks and tech, and it complements some of our other programs that are happening in person. Uh, in the past, we've had a ducks and tech event, a uh, face-to-face event in uh, San Francisco. We will be planning to return in just a matter of months. Uh, we also had a ducks and tech featured event in Portland, and so uh, this is definitely a coordinated effort with a number of volunteers, but if you're a duck in tech and you want to have a feature of those of you who are in this tech space wherever you are, uh, please don't hes hesitate to contact me and my colleagues at the Alumni Association. We would love to do what we can to feature your success, but also to facilitate the networking of ducks in tech. Um, along with me, uh, I would love to have my uh, associate introduce herself. Camille, could you please do a quick introduction? Yes, hello, my name is Camille Ogden, and I'm the program coordinator for the Duck Career Network. And um, I am a U of O alum, got my BA in 2006 and a post back in 2015. And um, just real quick, part of my role with this webinar is I will be facilitating the Q&A portion. So towards the end of the program, if you have questions that you would like the, the panelists to answer, um, please send me a chat. There's a little chat button up towards the right, uh, upper right-hand corner of your screen, and that'll come to me, and I can go ahead and, uh, go ahead and ask that on your behalf um, to our speakers. Fantastic, Camille. Thank you so much. Uh, one thing I will ask is also, uh, as you speak, please speak a little bit more loudly because I think uh, you're coming off a, a little bit softer than, than usual. Um, and I'm going to ask all the panelists to coach each other. So if, we, if you find that someone is starting to fade off, just, just let uh, let's one another know. Uh, so it is my honor and privilege to, to introduce, introduce this program. Um, as I mentioned, we have three accomplished ducks who are uh, here to share their experience, their advice, uh, their, their wisdom. Um, they are ducks who have worked in tech, who advise others in the space of tech, uh, who have also even hired individuals into, into tech. And so um, they, they uh, span, their, their expertise spans all of these areas. Um, and they also span geographies. Uh, we've got an alum who is participating from Portland, one who's with us here in Eugene, and another who is in the San Francisco Bay Area. So ducks in tech are, are not limited to just one specific region, and that's why we're so excited to bring to you uh, this webinar, because um, you can be participating from anywhere just as uh, a, an attendee or as a, uh, as a speaker. So uh, before I do the introduction, I, I would like to take a moment to just um, welcome you on behalf of the University of Oregon Alumni Association. Our mission is to foster lifelong relationships between ducks in the university and ducks with, uh, with one another, and particularly with the Duck Career Network. Our goal is to activate the entire network so that we become a career resource for each other. So whether you have career advice to share or that you are seeking career advice from um, insights and uh, career insights and advice from other ducks um, by uh, engaging in duck career network programs, hopefully will make it easier for those who want to give back and those who also want to help. Um, a special uh, acknowledgement to members of the University of Oregon Alumni Association because without your membership, uh, this would not be possible. Uh, your, your membership funds contribute to programming as well as uh, student scholarships. Um, so again, thank you so much for being part of our endeavor to make the U of O stronger um, and allowing us to make you the most uh, effective champions and cheerleaders, uh, ambassadors and advocates for the University of Oregon that we all love so much. So with that, um, let me start with our panel introductions. Um, We'll have a number of back and forth uh, questions and answers uh, throughout the program, uh, but let me start with Joe. Um, Joe, could you please introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about what you do um, and, and where you're at. Okay, so I'm Joe Maruschak. I'm the director of the Rain Eugene Accelerator. I started here in 2014, 
I got here by way of the video games industry. So I started at a video game company when I graduated in 98 called Dynamics here in Eugene. It unfortunately closed down in 2001. So I started my own video game company, which I then sold to a larger video game company here in town called Garage Games. And I was the director of technology. We sold that company to a, a large multinational corporation called IAC in 2007. In 2009, I left to pursue other interests. Uh, my other interests were mostly helping other entrepreneurs. I got introduced to a lot of startup people, and I started helping them. And then in 2014, they asked me to run the Rain Eugene Accelerator. So the Rain Eugene Accelerator, it, was, you know, it exists in the building that we're in. Uh, originally, it was host, housed at the Eugene Chamber of Commerce. It's a partnership between the University of Oregon and the local community, City of Eugene, Eugene Chamber of Commerce, it's a state-funded organization. There's a similar accelerator in Corvallis, uh, based at OSU. Um, and the, the accelerator program itself is run like a Techstars or Y Combinator, so if anyone knows what those accelerator programs are like, it's a cohort-based accelerator. Everyone's co-housed in the accelerator for a period of 16 weeks, and we do our best to accelerate them. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Joe. And thank you for hosting Camille and I here. Uh, those of you uh, who, who are watching right now, you can see that I'm in their uh, kitchen bar area. Camille is in their front uh, workspace. So, um, you know, even, even though we're here in the same building, we're able to show you different facets of, of this new exciting space. Um, so, uh, Isaac, could you please introduce yourself? Yes, thanks, James. Hi, my name is Isaac Babs. I'm an um, executive advisor, angel investor in the um, focus really on mobile only companies or mobile first companies. I'm a, a long time tech executive. I got into tech in uh, 1983, um, right out of the University of Oregon, uh, graduated in chemistry and um, ended up in technology by choice and been in for the last really 31, 32 years. Um, kind of had a long career initially, initially in uh, a big company, Hewlett Packard, a startup. It's very successful. They got acquired by another big company, Silicon Graphics. And then I was at uh, kind of a mid-sized company, probably heard of Macromedia, I was executive there. And then really since, um, uh, you could say 2002, I've been more of an entrepreneur, early stage guy with a whole series of mobile startups that have done uh, quite well. Uh, those are listed out on my LinkedIn. Um, I, I really focus on early stage companies now, mainly in the Bay Area and mainly around the mobile area. And um, the other thing that I've been involved with with James and, and other people, Joe included, uh, Cameron, we've got to get you involved too, is uh, setting up the Ducks and Tech Group, which has um, a presence on LinkedIn. So I would say please join there. And, and we're also trying to do more face-to-face -face groups around uh, the Bay Area and wherever else we want to have them. And I mainly set that up because uh, I found that most ducks, including myself, we kind of built our careers in silos. And um, now with the technology industry being as big as it is and more and more ducks coming out, I wanted to figure out a way to not only help people graduating, but also existing alums in the space to network and then other people in the space to further their own careers too. So a whole series of stuff, and I'm looking forward to answering questions you might have and, uh, and, and you know, being here with you. Thanks so much, Isaac. Uh, and, and I think you may have mentioned, uh, but you're uh, participating from the Bay Area, so thanks for representing uh, yeah, the, the San Francisco right Bay Francisco. Area. Excellent. Thank you, Isaac. Um, and last but not least, Cam, please introduce yourself. Yes, um, I'm, uh, I'm Cameron Lee, and I am a 2005 uh, graduate at the University of Oregon. I actually have a sociology degree, and I've been in the IT technology space for about 10 years, and uh, I found myself uh, finding technology by accident. I, uh, in, in, with a sociology background, I wanted to work with people, and right out of uh, after graduation, I, uh, I worked at a startup that was promoting uh, mission-driven success for college students. We wanted to increase uh, retention rates and graduation rates for, for university students. Um, and I found myself very quickly being uh, having a strong connection to techno technology and IT uh, and, and started to develop a CRM to start to house this data. And uh, as the years went along, uh, I found myself starting to learn new things, build relationships, and became a customer of the, of the company I work at now, Salesforce.com, located in San Francisco. 
uh, and, and a very lucky chance uh, was able to present at our largest conference, Dreamforce, on how the platform, Salesforce platform, uh, really benefited that, start, that startup. I have now been at Salesforce since, and uh, I've been tasked to growing the Northwest office. Uh, so I am here to certainly provide advice on how to uh, distinguish yourself as, as a candidate to get into the IT space, the IT or the uh, or the excuse me the technology platform space, and and looking for innovative, uh, very bright-minded individuals to to help grow our potential office here in the in the Portland area. So very excited to be here, and and it's been uh, it's been a pleasure to meet uh, to Isaac and Joe, and, and certainly look forward to the opportunity today. Thanks so much, Cam, uh, and thanks for representing Salesforce and the tech industry in Portland. It's amazing how big uh, of a presence tech is, is now in, um, in the Portland area. So uh, let me start with some of the questions. Uh, Isaac, you already mentioned a little bit that when you started your career in the tech area, most individuals were working within silos, and, uh, and that motivated you to start the, the Ducks and Tech networking group, both online and in person. Um, I guess, can you tell us a little bit more uh, about, uh, I guess, what it's like now or what you're hoping it to be? Um, and then hopefully, what, what might you want other Ducks and Tech to do to foster that uh, network that some other schools that might be in the Bay Area uh, seem to have uh, that we can model ourselves after? Yeah, no, no thanks. Um, you know, right now on LinkedIn, we've got about 443 people signed up. So you know, please spread the word. And, and what I'm hoping is, as I had mentioned, is how do we create an environment where we can network amongst ourselves, have our own career advancement, also then give back to um, to, to you know new graduates. Then I to also potentially, you know, can we have a conduit for new graduates to potentially, you know, can we hire them? Um, and even more so, can the alumni give feedback to the University of Oregon to continue to uh, create a curriculum where where when when ducks are coming out that they can get. You know, good tech jobs, and there's no doubt the um, tech continues to be a growth that fuels the economy, and that those that have it or have the skill set um, are going to be pretty successful at it. You know, so that, that's what I'm thinking in regards to ducks and tech, and I'd love to have it where uh, in certain cities, uh, whether that's the Bay Area or Los Angeles or Portland or Seattle. Uh, at least have an annual face-to-face -to, -face to get people together to try to continue to build on this. Um, I get a little sick of, because uh, I'm down in the Bay Area, how strong uh, Stanford and Cal is and a lot of the Ivy schools all the time. And there is, there is all, there, you know, there, there are a lot of ducks involved in technology down here and in Portland and in Seattle. Um, and I thought it would be an opportunity for us to come together and help each other. Fantastic, Isaac. Thank you also for setting up the steering committee to, to uh, work on some of these initiatives. Um, at this point, I think the, the largest, uh, uh, the, the area that's great, most greatly represented is the Bay Area, but um, I know you have uh, invited other uh, ducks to participate in the steering committee, and they can in many ways help us uh, reach into some of those uh, other markets. So uh, thank you so much. Um, Joe, uh, I'd love to uh, pose the question, the next question to you. Um, Particularly, uh, the, the point is that the campus at the U has changed drastically in just the last, you know, 10 years or so. And so when people come back to campus, they would be shocked at the, the new look. Um, now, on top of that, we have this amazing 942 Olive building that's not even on campus, um, that's actually here in downtown. Um, so could you tell, a little bit, uh, tell our viewers a little bit more about um, the new projects, uh, you know, that, that are, are, are sort of on, um, on the docket, um, and also in particular how RAIN and other programs like this can be either a resource for alums or how they might even contribute to, to the RAIN programs. Okay, so yeah, I'll give you a little bit of a background just on the RAIN program. So in 2013, the cities of Eugene and Corvallis and OSU and U of O uh, got together and they said, you know, we have a lot of technology and research going on here, but it's not particularly visible. What can we do to sort of up the level of, of uh, technology generation come out of tech transfer and make this a place like a little mini research triangle. So they came up with the idea of RAIN, the Regional Accelerator Innovation Network. And the idea was around surfacing um, high-tech startups you know, and, and giving them the resources they needed to move along. So the way this is evolving is you know, we set up the RAIN, initial RAIN Eugene Accelerator at the Eugene Chamber of Commerce, and now we acquired this building. So it's a, it's a, you know, it's a 
pretty huge, big building. And what we were finding, oh, hold on, my lights went out. I'll turn them back on really quick. And it's a nice, sustainable building that happens to turn the lights off when you don't move <laughs> in order to save energy, which you just saw there. So um, the idea was uh, a lot of innovation that we see doesn't come out of any one particular discipline. You know, I'm a fine artist, you know, campus sociologist. So what we found, what we needed to do was get people working together. And uh, at the U of O, everybody is in their little silo. So everybody's inside their building, college of education, computer science. So we want to create a building that actually had multiple disciplines in it. So we'd have people crashing into each other and learning about each other and creating startups, hopefully out of the collisions. So inside this building is the Rain Union Accelerator. So I work closely with the business school, computer science, and also product design. Product design here at the university uh, actually has the whole back half of the building. I'm gonna sort of motion to it. It's back over there. So in the back of the building, they're going to have the product design senior studio um, classroom, you know, sort of hang out pretty much all the time working on the projects, a polymer lab, which will have a laser cutter, 3D printers, CNC mill, sewing machine, old fabrication equipment, and a computer lab back there as well, and then sustainable materials chemistry, which is right over there. So the, the Tyler Invention Greenhouse is a group of people from the university that are concerned in, about um, sustainability in science, and they get together to talk about sustainability in science. The idea behind it was putting them all in one space would allow for collisions and collaboration and hopefully fuel new startups. The interest in getting everyone involved is that starting a business isn't a singular thing, you come up with an idea and it magically just turns into a business overnight. When a business starts to get traction, it needs to grow, and oftentimes what it needs is resources, you know, financial, but oftentimes what we're finding the need is just for mentoring. Uh, connectivity to people in particular industries that we can reach out to that can help guide these companies to help them grow. Um, so as it relates to everybody in our alumni network, if you want to become a RAIN mentor, you know, uh, you can get my email and we'll get you involved in the network somehow as a mentor or as an advisor or just to figure out what's going on. And if we can figure out that you're in a space where we have one of our companies go through the accelerator that we think you can help, we'll actually introduce you to them. And, and the goal would be for you to help them grow their company. Um, we, we're, you know, Rain is focused on creating companies that are going to stay here in the Southern Willamette Valley. So one of the things that we're trying to do is create companies here in the Southern Willamette Valley to give the opportunity to students leaving the U of O to uh, have a place to land and also a place to do internships. So I landed at Dynamics, a video game company, uh, by way of an internship I got when I was at the U of O. So if we could have more strong companies here in the Eugene, Eugene area, we can actually give students an opportunity to intern at these companies and um, begin their career that way. Fantastic, Joe. Uh, thanks so much for the ex uh, for the uh, explanation and also your expertise and and bringing that uh, back to the back to uh, the Eugene area. Um, so, Cameron, the next question is for you um, because I, I again, having seen the roster of uh, registrants, we actually have a huge, a uh, broad uh, spectrum of of uh, alumni viewers. Uh, they include recent grads to uh, individuals who have already founded their own business. Um, but the, I would love to hear. Uh, your, your perspective on uh, the, the hiring needs within the tech space. Uh, I love the fact that you mentioned you were a sociology major, Joe was fine arts, um, uh, Isaac was chemistry. So the, the skill sets are not just computer science or, 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 or IT specific. Um, so could you please comment on um, you know, what you see that, that is being valued, what students should or, or, or alumni should or shouldn't do when it comes to the job uh, search process, because I believe you mentioned that you grew the Salesforce Portland office from seven to over 200 uh, in the last three years. So I'd love to hear your perspective. Yeah, and coming from a sociology background, I love working with people. And, uh, and hiring has been a real big passion of mine. And, and so when, when looking to grow the Salesforce office, particularly in Portland, um, th there's really three things that I really look for in an individual. And, uh, you know, and I kind of made the, the joke to you, James, when I met you, right? I, I've, been, I've been here at, in this location now for three and a half, four years. I've hired a lot of beavers. I want to start hiring ducks, right? We have uh, the University of Oregon is the birthplace of innovation. And, and we've seen that with a lot of companies. Nike, obviously, is top of mind for everybody, right? And so how can we filter that innovation, that, that mindset, 
and, and get it into our alumni and, and give them opportunities to really do some of the greatest work of their lives. And so when I'm looking for candidates or I'm looking for uh, individuals that are, that are looking to get into the IT space or just any part of technology, so there's three things that I'm really looking for. Um, do you know your business, right? Are, do you, if you're an engineer or whatever role it is, um, can you speak to it and can you speak to what your customers are going to get out of that, right? Um, are, you, uh, are you able to, to communicate effectively and partner with those, uh, with those particular business partners? So do you know your business? Are, are you smart? Second is, uh, can you align and motivate? So can you align a team? Um, can you build relationships? Can you co collaborate? Uh, can you influence? And so if you know your business and you can communicate, the final piece really is, is the easiest. And that's just, uh, th that's motivate and champion. So do you, can you find a mentor? Can you find a buddy? Can you find somebody that can really kind of partner and champion your career? Uh, and so you can, you can effectively career plan yourself. Uh, I, I know a question was asked at the, at the last Ducks in Tech of thinking about, hey, what do you want to do long term? And there was, there's some feedback that I don't really like that question. I love that question. I want to be able to provide opportunities for individuals. Uh, in the next year, in the next two years, next five years. Uh, here at Salesforce, we don't want you to do what you've been in six months from now, the same job. We want to grow your skill set and your toolbox. So I really look for people that can understand their business, uh, they can align in team, they can motivate a champion, and they can build those relationships. Um, and that's what we've looked for in terms of growing the office here in Portland. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. So uh, moving the conversation forward, I will not necessarily uh, direct these questions to anyone, but I, I welcome all of you to share your thoughts. Um, and and uh, again, let, let's go from there. Um, as you reflect on your past uh, career path to date, um, are, are there one or two significant markers that you feel uh, were, were critical? I, either, you know, the classic proverbial fork in the road. Uh, can, can you share some of those aha moments? Because, uh, as I mentioned, I can imagine there may be some alums who are in the midst of career change and they're trying to figure out, you know, what do I give up? What do I need? Um, there may also be some uh, recent grads or soon to be grads who are trying to explore options because I, I even remember meeting one um, alum that I knew. Um, um, as he was transitioning, transitioning from the U of O to the Bay Area, and he was looking at different sectors, you know, uh, career opportunities in different sectors, or uh, weighing uh, the role of a supervisor. So um, I love your, your, uh, any of your input in terms of what were some of those significant uh, markers in your career path that you would uh, like to share uh, with, with uh, our, our audiences. So, so I could start. Um, so two, two for me were, were actually when I first started Dynamics. So I actually became a, an intern at Dynamics in 1996 while I was still at the U of O. You know, and I, I didn't have an idea that I wanted to get into video games when I was at the U of O. Um, it's when I started working at Dynamics as an intern that I really discovered that I really, really liked it. You know, so that was a, a really key point in my career. You know, I didn't have a very good idea of what I was going to do, what I was going to get out. But at that point, I really fell in love with video games. Um, that was the first key point. The second key point in my career was the closure of Dynamics in 2001. So when it closed down, I had like immediately had to make a decision about what to do with my life. Um, at that point, you know, I inter had interviewed with a lot of video game companies and had gotten a lot of job offers, but I saw a huge opportunity in video games on the web. And in 2001, video games on the web was sort of not a sexy thing. You know, the the, the web had just crashed a couple years ago, and the idea of doing games on the web, everyone sort of went like, good luck with that. It was a very good personal decision for me because um, I got into a really exciting space at a really exciting time. Um, but that was sort of key to me. And key to that was actually having people around me that I felt were good mentors to me, that I felt like I wasn't alone in doing this. And I could reach out to, to people that were going to help me grow my business. Because I, when I started my business, I, I didn't really didn't know what I was doing. And a lot of startups are always in that same boat. They start a business without a clue as what, what it means to start a business. So. Um, those were the key, two key points in my career. Excellent. Thank you, Joe. Hey, great. I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, give some. I would say um, the three things that um, that I could look forward in, uh, you know, pretty long career in tech is, first of all, is pick a pick. Like, I was fortunate to, number one, just get into tech. Just say, I'm going to, in 1983, I'm going to go into the computer industry. And so I'd say to any of you is pick a macro space so that there's going to be growth. And if there's growth, as all ships rise in the rising tide, you're going to have lots of opportunities. So look, so look at that macro space. And right now across tech, there are literally probably hundreds of different verticals. And they're not all the same. So look at that. 
I would say the second thing to uh, to look at is uh, is try to get on a winning team. Even if you are just starting out, pick a, pick the best company you can or the team you like the best, and then make sure that you're going to have success because and get to know that team. Because in tech, nothing really lasts; it's continually changing. But the people you meet, they'll stay with you forever, particularly if you like them or they like you. So that's the second thing. And then the third thing is you have to continually be recreating your thing, and I've been doing that um, over many, many different sectors of tech. Right now I'm focused on mobile. I've been on mobile for 13 years because it's been a long, long cycle. Um, but quite frankly, I'm thinking that now it's maybe it's time to be looking at other spaces. But I challenge you to also, you know, just so those, those three things. So um, that would be my advice. Excellent. Thank you, Isaac. Anything to add, Cam? Yeah, I would I would double down on uh, what Isaac had just mentioned. Uh, t taking opportunity, taking a risk, and perhaps getting your foot in the door uh, can be to your advantage long term. Uh, I know at least uh, early in my career, again, wanting to work with people uh, and trying to figure out, okay, hey, do I want to be more face-to-face -face or really want to in invest in, uh, in technology and IT? Uh, in finding the role that wasn't necessarily what I wanted at that time, but it allowed opportunity for me um, if I really focused on it and made the right relationships and, and did a good job. And, and so a big marker for me was taking that role that wasn't probably the right fit, but it, it, it showed that I could take some risk, uh, that I could innovate uh, and improve and get the job done. And along the way, the right will, role will, will come up. It, it's getting that foot in the door. And so um, don't necessarily sit back and, and find, you know, wait for something to come to you. Go out there and get it. And there's a ton, of, like Isaac mentioned, finding the right, the right team, the right company is incredibly important. Um, research that particular company. And, and the thing that I look for that I would say is really good advice that I received, find the culture and the values. What is the vision of that company? What are the values? And will you, uh, will you add to their culture and will you fit in from a culture standpoint? Because uh, there's a lot of things that go into your day-to-day -day behind coding or development or sales, right? It's how you interact with your with people, and it, does that align with your expectations and where you want to take your career? Uh, so that's certainly kind of my advice in terms of getting into, you know, get in there, get in, the, get get that foot in the door, and then you know it can be limitless from there. Great. Thank you so much, Cam. Um, I appreciate uh, all of your perspectives, particularly about just uh, knowing that maybe you are a work in progress, your organization is a, pro is a work in progress, and uh, there's a trajectory that you're looking for that you want to be able to ride. Um, I would love to get uh, your advice uh, because some of our viewers may be uh, still in school, so they have a chance to uh, build their experience base while they're still on the U of O campus or through an internship. Um, so you know, one question is, what advice might you have for those individuals who still have all those amazing U of O resources, college resources, uh, summer uh, internship kind of resources? Uh, but the other side is we obviously will have many alums who are already, are already off the college campuses. And so, um, you know, maybe you can address, while Isaac mentioned, aim for the, the uh, company that's doing very well, that's already winning. Um, but you know, for someone who might need maybe one or two stepping stone jobs, you know, every every job has has its benefits. Um, I'd love to to hear all of your advices on, uh, you know, for for these individuals, uh, you know, what what should they be doing in those particular contexts? Yeah, so um, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, anybody that's uh, really an undergraduate and wants to get into the tech industry, I'd say the number one thing is really work on internships. And really work on that even as soon as after your freshman year, sophomore year, junior year. It's it's hyper competitive at the good companies. The more domain experience you have, the better. So that would be the, the first thing. And you could find them in Eugene. They're they're harder. I mean, even guys like Joe and Cameron and you know they're they're around Eugene and Portland. Um, but they you know a lot of the kids are doing this. The the other thing I would say is um, a couple things while you're undergraduate is. Um, you know, the ability to read, write, speak, uh, math skills are just tremendously important. I would supplement it with um, with some core, some tech classes too. Um, you could also do those online. It's you know you need to know the vocabulary. You need to feel comfortable in it. 
And, and the the more kind of unique skills you have, the more that's going to differentiate you. So that those would be the things that uh, I, I'm I'm telling people that are undergraduates that want to get in the tech industry to do. Yeah, and I'll jump in there. Uh, take advantage of those resources on campus if you're a current student. The career services is a great area to start. I, I know that they can help prepare with regards to uh, interviewing techniques, resume building. Uh, and then when I when I look for uh, a candidate, right, I look for somebody, like I said, uh, innovation is huge for me. Take a risk. Uh, do your research on that company. What's a business problem that you can help solve for? Perhaps you can demo that in an interview when you're looking to uh, for a particular internship. It, it really kind of will help distinguish you as a candidate from all the others because everybody on this call knows, right, uh, like Isaac said, it's hyper competitive. Everybody we receive as candidates, they look great on paper. How do you distinguish yourself? So take a risk. Uh, and I love individuals that can, on day one, contribute to solving a business problem. So take advantage of those resources on campus. They're fantastic. Uh, that career services is, is, is excellent to help you prepare. And then, and then do your research on your own, and certainly it will set you up for success. Yeah, no, I'll add to this. Just start building your network now. I see a lot of graduates that are starting to build their, their professional network like the day they graduate, and you should be probably starting your network in your freshman year. You know, your professors at the university have connections in the tech industry. There are tech companies here with, with fingers all over the world. You know, if you're in Eugene, you should probably be in, involved in the Eugene tech community because you, you can actually meet some very experienced people that can guide you on your path. Um, and you can start that now, like as soon as possible, because if you wait until after you're in the workforce, you're sort of behind the eight ball. Um, the other thing is soft skills. You know, we, we actually, um, when we hired a lot of coders, we found that a lot of them really didn't have the management skills. So if you learn how to do meeting facilitation and do some of the soft skills, and these are skills that they, they get better when you practice them. So if you get involved in some extra, extracurricular activities where you're actually forming teams, running teams, getting things done, and it doesn't particularly matter what it is, but if you have the skills to actually get things done and drive them to completion, it's a huge benefit because we found there some, some really, really talented people that knew their you know, had their tech chops but could, actually couldn't run a team. And we actually had to search sometimes to find people that would run the teams for them. And uh, so the more skills you have in that area, the better you're going to do. Because oftentimes, you know, particularly in tech, a new project comes along, something that's, that's really sexy, that's a, a new division of the company. And if you're there at the right time, you can jump on that opportunity. You can have a lot of freedom to do something awesome. But you can't do it alone. You know, if you're doing something in tech and you want to get it done fast and well, usually you have to work with a bunch of other smart people with complementary skill sets in order to get it done. And if you don't have those skills to, to drive that team forward, then you might not be able to bring that project to completion and, you know, sort of uh, get get the notice that you need when you, uh, when you do those sorts of things. So. Excellent. Uh, I, I think many of us, and, and for the... Um, students who might be watching this, uh, oftentimes there's that notion of, oh no, this class has a group project and how do we just kind of get through those group projects? The reality is those are sort of little tests of the real world. You will always have group projects. Everything is group oriented and there's always going to be the person who's blazing a trail quickly and leaving everyone behind. There's people who are sort of, you know, um, still taking their time. So how do you work with those people? And remember that that's actually giving you the practice that um, has already been mentioned as being valuable. Um, and, and maybe a, a continuation of this, process, uh, of this question, uh, many of our, our viewers are going to be people who have been out of school for five years, 10 years, uh, 15 years even. Um, for those individuals, and some of them are actually looking to career shift, so they have been in consumer, traditional consumer products, or maybe they were in financial services, and they're now looking at tech being uh, a hot area to go into. What advice do you have for these individuals to maybe uh, magnify their transferable skills or to uh, identify where their current skill sets could actually still be very relevant within the tech space. I'll start there. You know, tech is everywhere now. So if you're in financial services, you know, FinTech, I mean, it's, it's just about everything, every sector that someone could be in, there is definitely a, uh, a tech component to it. So I wouldn't advise that you totally go out in left field and do something totally different. You sort of leverage the skills you have, leverage the industry knowledge that you have, but find out where the opportunity is in tech in your industry with what you know. Also leverage your network. You know, so if, if you are working in insurance and you know someone who's doing the, the tech side of insurance, an alumni or someone that you work with or a, a partner company, 
talk to them to see what they think. You know, actually leverage leverage the people around you to find out where you need to go and don't just sort of, and you could just take a, a left turn, but that usually is very, very difficult just to totally do an about face and do something totally different. It's easier just to take a one small step to the left into a different channel and then and then follow where it goes. That takes his dad to what Jeff was saying. He's right on. It's just uh, pick a role or a slot or position that you could leverage your skill set into. Unfortunately, in the tech industry, um, we're very slotted, and uh, that's in startups, and that's also in accelerators. That's in everybody. It's a, it's a slotting business, which uh, it's run, run by a bunch of tech people, and so it makes logical sense. But uh, if you want to kind of be everything, you can't really do that unless you're the CEO or the founder. You got to pick a role, and you got that's how you get in, and be really good at that and leverage your past skills, like Joe said. Yeah, and, and finally, kind of to, to wrap, to close the loop on that, finding a mentor. So uh, if you're in a sales role or if you're in a non-tech role, find somebody that you can reach out to and actually shadow them. Get an idea of what a day-to-day -day is like uh, and, and to have that self-reflection, right? Is this the right role for me? Or are there th here are things that I, that I really like that I can, I can put my own spin on this particular role uh, and, and take the risk and, and get out there and make those connections. Um, having a mentor and just a shadow and ha kind of have that eye-opening experience can, can really kind of open the door to be like, okay, do I want to make this lateral shift or, um, you know, get my feet wet into a brand new role? Uh, so certainly take advantage of that. Excellent. Again, thank you so much. For the next question, it's, it's going back to something that a number of you have brought up, which is networking. You know, Joe mentioned build a network before you need it, and oftentimes um, that, that's easier said than done, <laughs> and, and the greatest motivator is when you need it, but unfortunately, again, it may not be there. Could you uh, each share how you approach networking, how it fits into both your personal work and also personal priorities, uh, and when possible, could you also be specific? Um, I'll, I'll uh, maybe uh, direct this to, to uh, Joe, for example, because you know within Oregon we have the Technology Association of Oregon, so people might know that it exists. But then, once you know it exists, how do you plug in? So, uh, if you can share how you approach uh, networking, uh, and and again, I guess tactically, how do you leverage resources that might be around you? So maybe at this point, Joe, would you mind kicking kicking yeah, this one yeah. off? So, so networking is a huge part of my job. I'd say 50% of my job is actually networking, and a lot of it is reaching out to mentors and people that they know in order to gather the resources I need to wrap around the companies that I'm helping in the accelerator. So it's a huge part of my job. Um, I am going to a lot of events all the time, so I often have lots of late nights here and in Portland and all over the state. And a lot of this is just getting to know people deeply. So my particular way that I approach networking is I don't go to networking events and try and meet like 10 people and put them on my checklist and get them on LinkedIn. So what I try and do is when I go to a networking event, I try and have at least two deep conversations with two people, like get to know two people really, really well. Um, and that's my goal at every event that I go to is meet at least one person, hopefully two, but if it's only one, that's okay, and just get to know that person really, really well. And this is actually a fairly, fairly deep conversation. And then build those relationships over a period of time. Um, locally in Eugene, there's a ton of events to go to. We have you know, the Technology Association of Oregon, the TAO, sort of after hours, and I would recommend that everybody that's in tech that's in Eugene, that's at the school, go to as many of those as possible and just get to know people. Um, you know, there are people here in Eugene that actually work for Silicon Valley startups. Like the CTO of Hotel Tonight like lives here in Eugene. So you can actually meet people here in Eugene that you wouldn't think have connectivity to the outside world, but they do. And a lot of us just start doing it. Get out there, um, try and meet one person, try and have a deep conversation with that person, follow up and see where it goes and do that constantly. Don't, you know, don't be afraid. You know, um, for me, it's, it's, I, I go to the events all the time at, at the U of O. So I, I speak at the U of O, I go to the computer science department and talk there. And at the end, I have a stack of business cards and I say, here, contact me, I'll have coffee with you, I'll buy you coffee, I'll tell you whatever you want. And I've had a class of 40 or 50, maybe one or two sort of following, take me up on that. And it's surprising to me because I'm, I'm not a particularly scary person and I'm sort of offering to help them. But there's this intimidation factor. I, I don't know what it is, but they're just like, you know, here I am, just a student, my little problems. Like, you know, I couldn't bother that busy person with my, with my small, tiny problems or my insecurities or my, my lack of direction. And um, where I am right now, it's like, I, that's what I'm here for. I'm here to help these people get in to the community 
but they're not taking advantage of it. So I would tell everyone, like, take advantage of the opportunities that are there. There's a ton. Once you open your eyes and look around, there's almost too many. Like, if you're in Eugene, you could go to an event every single night that's either involved in the startup community or the tech community. You know, so it's not hard to find. Excellent. Thank you, Joe. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I'll jump in here. The, the Technology Association of Oregon was huge for us at, at Salesforce. Uh, we opened an office uh, here a few years ago, and you know, we were I, I was assigned to, to grow the space. And coming from the Bay Area and, and trying to get our footprint in the in the local Northwest community was difficult. And so, uh, so getting yourself out there, and, and the Technology Associ Association of Oregon has just been a blessing for us in terms of uh, meeting leaders in the technology space up and down the West Coast. But a, a really an opportunity to uh, to find and recruit talent. Uh, we do things very differently here at Salesforce, and we actually did a social hire event through the Technology Association of Oregon, where we brought in 30 individuals uh, and put them through a social hire where they solved a business problem. Uh, they worked as a team on a team event, and uh, and then did a t did a, a coding exam, and then we made offers that day. So what what other company is out there that is uh, is recruiting people and then making offers in a single day? And the Technology Association of Oregon really kind of provided us with a lot of great uh, candidates and just getting relationship building within within the community. Uh, and if you're not a part of that, my question is, what's stopping you? Right, kind of do the self coaching. Uh, and, and get out there. Uh, I can tell you it's been a huge, huge partner for us, uh, particularly in the Portland area, and we're certainly looking to expand that throughout the Northwest. So um, if it's stopping you, it's certainly just make that first step and, and get out there, and it can be a huge resource for you. You never know what doors can open. I'm going to follow up on this really, really quick because we had the Experience Oregon bus tour. So we actually had a bus that was at the U of O pick up people from the computer science building and take them to local tech communities. This was at TAO. It was called Experience Oregon Tech. It took place in January. And um, that, like, it, you can't make it any easier. A bus shows up, we'll pick you down, take you downtown, and we will take you to different tech companies so you can actually talk to them. So when these opportunities are there, take advantage of them. Yep. And this is just me tossing it out there, but I hear about all these hackathons now. And so, um, you know, again, if any of you have any uh, expertise to, to add to what goes on there, please do. Uh, but I want to make sure, uh, Isaac, if, if you can also share uh, what's on the ground in the Bay Area for people to plug in, to, to meet people, to learn about um, uh, what's going on. I mean, there is, uh, there's an infinite, infinite number of things you could do down here. Um, my advice for um, anybody out there is, um, you know, what goes around comes around. Um, so I, I always try to, like, you know, you have to be ready to help people because they're going to help you. And that goes with networking and offering them value. And then, then maybe in the future you might get value back. Um, that would be the first thing. So just, just be open to helping people. And you'll be amazed how they'll be open to helping you. The um, the second thing um, I would just say is that uh, try to develop and, and Joe alluded to this deeper deeper relationships and particularly you know whether that's on college whether you're on the university your first job your second job there's going to be groups of you that are together try to get those as tight as possible because those are going to actually be your tightest relationships as you go through your life. And as long as you stay in contact with them, there's going to be a tremendous amount of value that could be very bi-directional. And so try to develop strong networks. So, Excellent. Thank you, Isaac. So uh, I want to do a little uh, segue for a moment. Camille, uh, I, I'm going to ask one more question, and then I'll come to you to see what questions may have been posed by our attendees via the chat feature. Uh, so, you know, you'll, uh, again, so uh, that's a call where if you have a question and you, you would like it posed to our uh, speakers, either all three of them or individually, please do add it to the chat feature and uh, Camille will, will relay those to us in just a few minutes. So the, the last prepared question I have for all three of you uh, is this. Um, 
Thank you so much for stepping up and raising your hand and being a duck who's willing to help other ducks simply by participating on this uh, webinar. You're sharing your expertise and your insights. Uh, again, so I can't thank you all enough. Um, and by being visible, I would expect that some people will reach out to you via LinkedIn or they'll try to follow up with you via an email. So uh, in, in many ways, I, I'm um, hoping that you will give some advice to those people. Uh, and, and I'm trying to do it in sort of a fun way because I have heard people who do that effectively and just within a matter of an email, uh, they've built up their reputation in some other's minds. Or the flip side, uh, in that simple outreach effort, they've done something where uh, the response is, eh, they didn't really put themselves all in. So could you uh, maybe each give advice on, you know, when people reach out to you, what really impresses you? What makes you want to help that person more? Um, and on the flip side of the coin, are there things that people do that you can share with them that actually is undercutting their, their outreach efforts because they're not doing it very effectively? So um, whoever would like to, to start with this one. Yeah, I'll go ahead. Um, with me, I get contacted by tons of people. It's to be, you know, know a little about what what my what I'm doing, and then uh, be very specific, and then be very specific about what the uh, what the win is for me and what the win is for them for us to actually do something together, or uh, what the ask is. Um, a lot of people will send presentations, proposals, pitches, decks, and um, they expect you know me just to read the whole thing, versus uh, I'd rather have a synopsis like let's let's kind of cut to the chase here and what what it is pretty quickly. So I would be short, concise, and to the point. And um, what's the ask? And the easier I could understand it, the quicker I could answer. Either way, positively or negatively, I try to respond either way. A lot of times I just I say no, but I try to get back to people. Great, great. And in this case, I might even add, the ask might be, could I, you know, have 15 minutes of your time uh, via Skype to ask advice? Or, you know, it might be a student who says, I'm coming back home for the Bay Area. I'd love to meet you for a cup of coffee. So the specifics like that. I, I, I'm open to that sometimes. It depends on where you are in your career. <laughs> yeah, good point. Good point. Thank you. Thank you. It is, uh, um, I'm, uh, but uh, I, I, I think it's, I think you should try to get people that could, you could do that with. No. I, I don't know if I'm the right person for that. I've got uh, so. Um, so. No, appreciate the honesty, and I think for for the uh, viewers, do keep in mind some of the people who are the busiest and and most influential may not have time to do what I might call initial level uh, networking. So just be strategic about who you reach out to and when you approach them. So thank you. Yeah, I, I don't, I mean, you guys, who's ever, whoever wants to do that, um, if, if they can't meet you for coffee, don't take that the wrong way. I usually, if I don't know somebody, I start with an email, very short, and then if that's positive, I'll have to do a short call. And if that's positive, then I might meet them. Excellent. Thank you, Isaac. Cam or Joe, any additional uh, feedback? I'm going to underline everything Isaac just said. <laughs> you know, um, a, a lot of it's be concise and be clear what you want. So when people send me emails, they, they need to say, hi, I'm this. This is what I'm doing. This is the information or resource that I need from you. You know, it's like I'd like to sit down and get some feedback on this particularly, or I would like to meet some person who can help me with this. So if the ask is very, very clear, I can be very, very helpful. What not to do? Don't send me a four-page email that wanders all over the place at the bottom saying, hey, would you mind meeting for coffee so I could pick your brain? Because it's, it's like, you know, I, I don't, I mean, they're, they're on a fishing expedition for something. I don't know what they're fishing for. They don't know what they're fishing for. And if they don't know what they want out of me, then I don't know what I can do for them. So I've, I've been to a lot of those meetings because it's, it's sort of my job to meet with a lot of people. And the ones that, that get traction with me or the ones that come and sit down with me, when they sit down with me, are very, very clear about what they're going, where they're going. And if they're not clear, they're very, very clear of their gap, which is like, there's this big void of information that I don't have. Can you help me explore that? And I'll work with them to sort of uh, identify that gap in their knowledge and try and connect them with someone who can help fill that gap. But having that, that you know, like, I have absolutely no clue what to do, it's like get some sense of a clue. You know, you do have some idea of what you're doing. You have some idea of why you're emailing me. So make it clear what the idea is. Make it very, very concise. You know, it is, I see multi-page emails with multiple questions. It's, 
Give me one that's a, you know, a paragraph, a sentence with a very, very specific question. Thank yeah, you, Joe. Joe and Isaac nailed it, right? Like, I'm sure we, we get dozens of emails or asks to, to offer that career advice or opportunities that might be available. Um, and I'll go back to that first characteristic that I, that I mentioned before, right? Know your business. Uh, and I, when I meet with somebody that I have not met before, but they can, they know their area or they have done research on the area they want to get into, that at least will be an icebreaker that we can start a conversation. Uh, but without that, it's, uh, you know, it's, it can be a waste of time on their end, on our end as leaders in the industry. Um, and we want to be here to help and, and set them up for success. So be prepared. Uh, and, and know that everybody is busy, but 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 know your business and and do that research to to help set uh, you up as up for for more success. And, and I will say um, I uh, I put myself out there on the um, on the alumni uh, uh, book in terms of uh, I, I've reached out to or excuse me I've had students reach out to me uh, already in terms of just asking questions. I'm I'm happy to do that. Uh, I I would say that. Um, once I did put myself out there, uh, it, it can get um, it, it can get a little bit busy. So certainly, just be prepared for that um, and, and know that hey, if if it doesn't feel like we're totally engaged, it's because we're 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 asking those questions in ourselves, and we want to make sure that we can set you up for success. So um, certainly, be prepared and, and know your business. I'm going to follow up on that just a little bit. You know, so for me, now that I've been part of Rain, there's been so many articles written on what I'm doing that if you Google my name and it's not you know it's not a common name, you'll see pages and pages of stuff on me. So when someone sits down with me and they're like, well, tell me what you do. It's like, <laughs> you requested the meeting with me. Did you not Google who I am? You know, it's, it's like get past that. So if, if somebody is showing up to a meeting totally unprepared, doesn't know what I've done, doesn't know what I can do, doesn't know how I can help them, and actually doesn't just know the first thing about me other than that they, they saw my name and thought they'd email me, it, it's kind of frustrating because it, it's like, is this person going to do the work that they need to do to move their career forward if they can't even like type my name into Google? You know, so I, I, you know, I'm going to double underline that one. Be prepared when you show up to meetings. We can help you if you're prepared. But if the only thing that you get out of the meeting is me saying, like, hey, you're unprepared, go away. And that's useful knowledge, but you could have gotten so much more. Excellent. Fantastic advice to help set up our alums and uh, future grads up for success. Uh, Camille, let me turn it over to you. Uh, do we have questions from our viewers? Yes, we do. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah. A little, a little louder would still be great. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> great. So um, from our uh, attendees, we have quite a few U of O law students. And so they're wondering if the panelists can sort of um, have a twofold uh, discussion on as you know becoming a new lawyer, how you can um, articulate your value to firms uh, you know that maybe have in-house counsel, counsel. So how can you um, sort of overcome this? We have our in-house group, and then but I'm a new lawyer, and I've got tech interests, and so I'm really interested in in um you know showcasing my value because of my tech knowledge, but also because I'm I'm a new lawyer. So can you speak to that at all, and and maybe just have an an overarching conversation as well about um, the potential opportunities and relationships, uh, you know, professional relationships between. Um, the, the law side of things, and then also the growing tech industry. Yeah, so I, um, I, I deal with legal aspects pretty much every day, um, and I've been in a, a lot of big corporations. So um, if you want to deal with startups, uh, most likely you're going to have to be at a big firm or be independent and kind of you know, be able to hustle and get your business there. If you want to be at kind of mid-tier, maybe 100 to maybe 50 million, uh, above up to whatever 250 or 500 million in revenue, um, there is opportunities there. You have to hustle to get in the door as an in-house counsel. There will probably be a GC already on staff, um, and the GC might also run business development. So the more deal savvy you are, or corporate development, or, or teaming with the corporate development person, and then on bigger corporations, um, there's opportunities because there's many divisions. Um, you know, most of them will have um, their own law firm, some group, and a lawyer in them. So, I mean, there's opportunities, but you're going to have to do your research depending on what size the firm is, 
and you know what there is. I will say though, a lot of the more technical companies are hiring um, lawyers that have an undergraduate using a technical degree, um, just so they understand kind of what it is, or maybe they've already had experience with. Um, a lot of times, uh, firms will hire the actual um, associate or uh, a junior lawyer that's at the law firm that's um, that's, the, that's the company's law firm and bring them in house. So, um, but just like we had talked before, you've got to be focused. You've got to kind of know what you're looking for, and you got to you got to be you know you got to you got to go for it. Yeah, and in, here at Salesforce as an enterprise size company, we uh, we actually require our legal counsel to have a certification of our product. So Isaac, you know, nailed it right there again, right? Pairing the technology with the legal skill, I think, will really put you at an advantage. Uh, and it, within our organization, we actually have attorneys uh, within each org. And so uh, having that sales mindset, or having that engineering mindset, or having platform, having development, is something that we really do uh, here on our side. Uh, so being able to pair that technology with what you're learning um, as, a, as a young attorney will certainly set you up for success. Yeah, and, the, and the, the bar is pretty high. So when you work in the tech industry, a lot of what you're going to be, what you do, even when you're in development, actually has a legal component to it. So expect if you get into a technology firm, even in the startup, um, the, the people that are working are, are pretty sophisticated when it comes to contracts, when it comes to a lot of things. So you, you've got to be able to go into that contract and add a lot of value. If your knowledge about licensing, licensing software is very rudimentary, um, expect that some of the executives in the company who are not lawyers might have a great deal more knowledge than you about that. So you've got to be pretty impressive and pretty on point to get in the door, and then you've got to add value. In the tech industry, there is this, um, you have to start adding value immediately before or show that you might be able to add value immediately to even sort of get in. Because the idea that you're going to bring someone in who doesn't have a lot of knowledge, where you're not exactly sure what exactly they're going to do, you usually don't take the risk. There's just no time, and the resource drain to train somebody is actually quite high. So you focus and realize that that you know just like a coding job, you actually have to be really, really, really good, good and really, really, really knowledgeable if you want to get into software, knowing a lot about the legal side of software like inside and out, you had better impress an executive if you go into the in for an interview with your knowledge because you don't want them knowing more than you about software licensing for issues, for, for, for set of issues. Yeah. Great, Camille, any uh, additional questions? Yes, um, so this one is a totally different topic. And Cam, I think it is coming off of your earlier conversation about sort of the social hire and um, how company culture in general is sort of shifting to this uh, tour of duty, if you will, approach to, um, you know, knowing what your colleagues' specific roles are and job shadowing and that sort of thing. And so the question off of uh, that line of thinking is, can you share anything that companies are doing to sort of um, offer different incentives to current employees? Like how are they uh, promoting this change as a good thing that comes with benefits for the employee as well? And uh, yeah. yeah, if you could speak to that directly. Yeah, uh, you know, particularly for us in our space uh, in CRM and software and, and also just being in Silicon Valley, right? We we have to have a, a really good offer package that maybe Google or Facebook or Twitter may, may have. And so what we've done uh, is we've been very innovative and creative uh, in, 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 in that offer package, what we can give to that individual. So um, we have a one 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 model with volunteership. So what we do is we, uh, we give you a week uh, within that calendar year to get paid to go and volunteer. So finding a nonprofit that you are really have passion about and, and make a difference uh, with that particular uh, nonprofit. So, for example, myself, um, I love being infused with it. the University of Oregon, obviously. So, I've been a I've been big um, advocate for the Women in Flight Student Athlete Program. And so, volunteering a week of my time in a year and doing it on the dime of Salesforce is something that I think can, can distinguish us from maybe our competitors and bringing in a good candidate. Uh, the the other thing in, in technology is uh, we uh, we haven't done a great job, I think, historically on diversity. And so recruiting diversity, re recruiting women, and uh, making sure that we can provide the benefits uh, that, that are important to them. 
Now, not all, all women were definitely will want to have a child someday, but if you do, we want to make sure you can have leave, right, and have respectable leave. And so what we've been trying to do is push a year of, of on leave if, you're, if you plan to have a child. And, and that's certainly that's important to us. Um, we're really defined by what we call our aloha spirit. So, uh, so for those that have been to Hawaii and, um, and have been able to, to infuse what Hawaii is like, our company was founded on a vacation in Hawaii. So we bring aloha spirit in everything we do. So we're very much involved in ohana and family. And those are the things I think that separate us and will separate some of the other startups uh, or other companies in, in technology on the West Coast are those extra benefits, right? If it's volunteering, if it's on leave, uh, if it's PT on. Now, I think a lot of companies are starting to use the PT on. And for, for those of you that don't know, um, you know, in my organization at Salesforce, I'll give uh, opportunities for members of my team to go away for three or four days and, and do a leadership summit and work on a business problem and then come back and let's find something tangible that we can where we can solve for. So it's getting out of the office. Uh, it's it's starting to brainstorm, and so it's those things that I think have really helped us here uh, at, at Salesforce. So um, being innovative and creative has been really added added an advantage for us. Great. So Camille, uh, maybe do one more question before we shift over to the web chat platform where people can talk one on one with each other as well as our speakers. Yeah, so um, one more question will go with, um, to all panelists, what advice do you have for raising capital for a startup? Yeah, I'll, I'll um, sorry, I guess I gave this all the time, and you probably shift to that. Um, I have three things I look at, and um, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's probably a long answer, but uh, I look at the macro space, and um, kind of what's what's going on in it, how big it's going to be, and whether it's really it's um, for me particularly, you know, is it a blue water opportunity or is it a red water opportunity? Blue means it's clear, red means there's a lot of competition. I look at the quality of the um, the team, and then third, I look at the idea. Um, you know, and it depends on what's you know for anybody just starting, it's very very hard to raise money. I don't want to scare anybody off. Go to the people that know you best. Go probably to your friends and family, and they're the ones that know you best, are going to love you, and most likely they're going to get going. If you can't do that, you better be doing something super unique, and you should be doing this anyhow, differentiated, potentially a big market opportunity, or low capital requirements, or just do it without raising money, um, because raising money is of the hardest things that you will ever do in your career, bar none. And so, um, and those are just kind of the tip of the iceberg key things at a macro level. Yeah, I'm going to sort of follow up on that. Um, it's super, super difficult. Uh, if people are trying to, you know, I, I teach a 16 week class at the accelerator, and most of what we do is around getting people ready to raise money. And it's, it's really, if you want to raise money, have, actually have a solid business in a good sector, you know, and, and expose that to people. So if you actually have a good business in a growing sector, you should be able to raise money if you can raise a competent team. The other thing that I like to see is people that are, uh, availing themselves of the resources that are there. You know, I have people that apply to RAIN, the accelerator that I run, and I'm actually involved in a whole bunch of other things in the community. So if I, I think in the application I've never heard of the person before, that's sort of kind of telling to me, are they really taking advantage of the resources that are out there? So you know, in this small community in Eugene, we actually have a whole bunch of you know, the startup community, the technology community. Most of the people that are going to be successful raising money locally around here, we already know because they're already about meeting with people and asking them, where, where are the gaps in my business plan? Um, what resources do I need? Can you help me find those? So when people are reaching out and trying to gather the right resources around their company, those are the things you want to invest in. Those are the people that are out there looking to actually put the company together in the right way. The, the things that sort of turn me off when you're raising money are the people that are sort of very, very pig-headed, you know, which is like, give me money, I don't need any help. Um, it, it's sort of like if, if, you know, if you don't want my help, why do you want my money? Yeah, I'll just say real quickly, you know, speak the insights, challenge business as usual, right? Uh, having that niche or that uh, specialization or that innovation that you can speak to and, and knowing your business, knowing your customer's business, 
uh, will will certainly help there. So uh, challenge that, right? Challenge that business as usual philosophy, and I think that can kind of help you move along a little bit quicker. And then the, we have this thing that we keep telling people in the accelerator: seek out money, you'll get advice. Seek out advice, you'll get money. <laughs> Excellent, excellent. Well, my job is not to close this program yet, but it's to move us to the next phase. Uh, before I do, I can't thank enough Isaac, Cam, and Joe for spending your time and expertise and energy with us. Uh, this was just part one where we were all able to uh, engage in a conversation and, and glean some, some wonderful takeaways uh, from, from these wonderful you know, contributing uh, alumni, uh, participating alumni. Uh, so once I close this webinar, um, the website for the web chats via the Brazen platform should automatically pop up on your screen. So I believe most everyone has already registered. In case you did not, you actually can still register uh, in the moment and then be able to participate right away. And as a reminder, this platform allows you to have one-on-one -on -one, uh, web chats with the individual speakers. They will be located in one virtual room. And if you'd like, you could also uh, line up in the second virtual room, which allows you to meet each other. Uh, because we're all about growing the, ne the network and, and especially the Ducks and Tech network. I, I want to point out that you can actually get in line um, in both of these rooms and whichever one opens up first, you will be able to get matched with someone in that room and it doesn't take you out of line for the next one um, until you're ready to be uh, uh, matched in that particular room. So hopefully that makes sense. And remember, there's no audio, there's no video, it's text only. But remember, this is also a way to start the conversation. And if you find that here's someone that you really would like to get to know better, before the eight-minute countdown runs out, um, express your interest in following up, exchange emails, and set the expectation that you'll be able to follow up um, after this web chat is over. So with that, once again, on behalf of the University of Oregon Alumni Association, thank you for joining us today. If you have any questions about the Alumni Association as a whole, don't forget our website is uoalumni.com. And with that, uh, I will start shutting down the, the program, and uh, we will hopefully see you virtually on the next platform in just a few minutes. Thanks, everyone.